publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers. No more barriers. No one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It's The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. I was going to say where we've been, but I don't think we can say where we've been. It's been, it's been secret. We've had a series well, of secret yeah, meetings. We, we can say we've had a series of secret meetings. Um, and I've kind of hinted in a Facebook post that we might have some fairly big news to announce at 20 Books. Um, but we can't say much more than that. There they were intense some, meetings and they were in London. They were, yes. And um, with an interesting wrinkle, one of our colleagues who was in, the, in a small, badly ventilated room for two of the three days, sitting next to me on the second day, didn't come on the third day because the cough that she had was right. COVID. Um, so that's great, especially because I've uh, I've got to go. Well, I'm hoping going to Tenerife for a holiday, which I really badly need. Um, next Friday, so a week today as we record. Oh, this. I think you'll so, be all right. Uh, well, we'll see. Won't we? Let's, let's see. Um, I woke up this woke morning. Up this morning. Da, 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 da. <laughs> and um, felt felt a little bit grotty, um, but that might just be because I've been commuting for the first time in yeah. ten years. Going back to forth from London, and had a few, couple of beers last night, didn't we? Yeah. And, um, so I don't know. I feel okay. Bit, I've got a bit of a frog in my throat. And I got so. back to St Pancras and my train was cancelled. So I had to wait an oh, hour dear. for the next one, which is not God. fun. That's bad. Uh, reminded me why I don't like commuting anymore. Yes, well, we, we, we don't do that. But anyway, so yeah, I've got my fingers crossed. So, dear listener, it actually is pointless because if, if, when this goes out, I'll know if I've got COVID or not. So even if I ask listeners no, to... Too late for the... Thoughts um, and prayers. Think, think about that. Yeah, thoughts and prayers is way too yeah. late. So we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Um, so we have a couple of announcements. First of all, I don't think we've announced it before, but we are, as we, we do every autumn opening launch pad, self publishing launch pad for enrollment uh, very shortly on November the 1st. It'll be open for a couple of weeks. Uh, so this is your foundation course. This is the course that will tell you everything in terms of your platform you need on which to build a commercially successful career as a self-published author what the word was then so things like main lists uh things like choices about whether to get exclusive or why things like your product page about how you product your book uh basically from the moment you've written the end to the moment you start running ads that's everything else you need in place getting reviews uh, metadata i mean oh, everything's in it and a little tie into today's interview today's interview is a must listen interview whatever stage you are at in your publishing career whether you've got 100 books or you're about to publish your first book today's interview is a must listen interview that's coming up in a moment um, lots of good stuff in that but that does tie in now if you want to know more about launchpad you can find out more at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash launchpad it's going to be open on the 1st of November, Wednesday the 1st of November. It'll open around 10 p.m. in the UK, so that's a little bit earlier in the day in New York and in Los Angeles. And if you want to know in person anything about Launchpad and you want to have a chat and maybe even buy us a beer, you can do that because Mark and I, a couple of days after the opening of Launchpad, will be uh, getting in airplanes hopefully we'll be over COVID by then, and flying to Las Vegas. Come and say hello. We'll be at 20 Books Vegas, which is the uh, probably is the world's largest independent author conference. Mm. Uh, I don't know what Vegas is going to be like. I mean, it looks horrific at the moment, trying to walk down the strip, dodging the F1 uh, grandstands. I'm very excited about F1 being in Las Vegas, but I don't think we're going to have the best of it three weeks beforehand uh, with construction everywhere. The fountains closed, oh, the no. volcanoes closed, everything's closed. Uh, to make way for it but uh, anyway anyway that's uh, that's our problem not yours i bet they're really thrilled it's, it's such a competitive year yes i know the championship's actually over and uh what a pointless yeah, race it's a race for second isn't it which is actually quite an exciting race for yeah. second um yes i know but it's still going to be thrilling uh, to see them and i, th I know the drivers actually yeah. there'll be quite a party mood but i think because the championship is over i think uh, max might even relax and smile, which he does occasionally. Uh, it is going to be quite awesome uh, to see it, but uh, it's going to be disruptive for us for sure. And I was looking at some of the video of the stands. I mean, they look permanent. I mean, these are big structures going up, and obviously I guess they're going to take them down. I hope so, otherwise we'll never see the Bellagio Fountain again. But anyway, yeah. 
Yeah, no, that'd be. I forgot about that. It'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. So we've got that coming up. I'm going on a little road trip, and I'm taking Thomas with me. Um, I'm forcing him. So it's basically an abuse of power. So he's coming with me to look at Crater, Arizona, and then the Lovell Observatory on the Saturday. I think you get in on the Saturday or Sunday, so we'll see you on the Sunday. Um, and, uh, yeah, he had no choice. I said to him, he says, you're coming to Vegas. You're going to sit next to me in the car and listen to me talk about it. Now, he loves all that stuff. He's a science fiction author. No, he He's doesn't. a science fiction author. He told me he, how, how much he loves your road trips. So, uh, yes, anyway, so yeah, that'll be interesting. And the other thing we have to mention is the live show, don't we? That we our own, speaking of live shows, our own one. Um, tickets will be available as this goes out. So, um, yes, move quickly, because I think it's, yeah, we usually have a, a bit of a rush in the first few days. I don't think it will sell out immediately, but you never yeah. know. Yeah, so uh, early bird price, which we're going to put up uh, till for about a month, actually. So that'll be your chance to get a good price to come to the conference. Europe's biggest independent author conference. Um, back in London, South Bank Centre, the home we know and love. And hopefully it'll be middle of June. Nice, beautiful summer's day in London, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to that. We are just starting the process. I guess you're just starting the process of scheduling now, but we're going to have some good names. Well, we know yeah. from the past three conferences, we get big names. Yeah, yeah. So I'm starting to look into that now. I had a couple, couple kind of penciled in already. So uh, yeah, I'll start getting into that in earnest in the next month or two. Start kind of uh, slotting people in there. But yeah, it's 25th and 26th of June. Um, so that that's the date. And the URL you need is selfpublishingformula.com forward slash SPS Live. Uh, that SPS Sierra Papa Sierra. Live. Lima, yes, exactly. Indigo, be, yeah. no India. Lima, Victor, Echo, uh, Echo. Indigo sounds <laughs> yeah. better than India. Okay. Yes. So yes, that's uh, as I think. Launchpad will be open on November the first. You can buy your tickets to Self Publishing Show Live London now. If you're anywhere in the world, come over. It's an excuse to come to wonderful London, glorious Western Europe, and maybe even other parts of Europe. And uh, yeah, come and say hello to us. It's a great show, a theatrical like show. You sit in a theatre, it's well lit, well produced. It's everything. Uh, cast are a bit shit, but anyway. The what's yeah. a bit shit? <laughs> the cast the is cast, a bit shit. The cast is brilliant. The act, the act, well, the, the, the kind of the compares, they, they, they leave a bit to be desired. Comedy, but yeah, the guests comedy are amazing, gold, but, um, the compares. Um, <laughs> good. Okay. I think that's all our announcements for this week. As it seems to be a lot going on, a lot changing. Um, in the world at the moment uh, of self-publishing so we've had a few things going on with amazon in the background we talked about some of it category changes we talked about the ai questions that have come in there's a sexually explicit question i don't even know when that question came in that's been there it's been, it's been there for, for a while but um yeah people are sort of stumbling across it now and i think a couple of people have found it ticked for some reason so we've had all that probably in the last year but the category changes potentially are the most significant of those in terms of its immediate impact on our book's visibility. And understanding the choice you face now in making category choices is really important. And we have one of the best voices in the world on this subject, which is Dave Chesson, who's over there in Tennessee. And Dave makes it his business to be on the inside on these questions. This is a really strong interview really insightful with some direct advice for you and Dave does a great job of explaining it so let's listen to Dave Chesson and Mark and I will be back for a quick chat at the end of the interview this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer Dave Chesson welcome back to the self-publishing show you've been I have had two or three times at least but you are a pillar of the community I would say how do you feel about being a pillar uh, well, I guess that puts a lot of weight on me. No, I'm just, yeah. um, <laughs> it's, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. I, you know, being a part of the community for so many years and just always kind of keep trying to keep my finger on the pulse of Amazon. I mean, Amazon keeps me busy. We'll put it that way. Yes. They keep us all busy, don't they? Now, if people don't know who Dave is. You can introduce yourself in a moment, but if you've done our Launchpad course, you'll be familiar with Dave's beautiful Southern tones because uh, he's the guy who teaches you all about metadata which is everybody's favorite subject. Um, <laughs> and that's what we're talking about today, because I'm going to guess at some point we're going to need to re-record little bits of that as we're already going through the KDP bookshelf stuff as well, because that's changed because of AI recently. Um, but that's what we're mainly going to talk about today. But Dave, why don't you just tell people who perhaps aren't so familiar with who you are, who you are? 
Yeah. Well, uh, I'm Dave Chesson and uh, I'm the creator and the guy behind Kindlepreneur.com. That's like Kindle Entrepreneur. I'm also the creator of Publisher Rocket and Atticus. Um, for me, I grew up with, uh, you know, kind of uh, having problems with um, dyslexia. And I always struggled with writing and grammar and things like that. But it didn't mean that the dream you know, to, to actually be an author would disappear. And so for, for me, I started looking at the markets and I started using kind of that understanding to help me with my writing. And that's really where I took off. And so I started chronicling that inside of Kindlepreneur and have built tools from there as well. Yeah. And uh, those tools for many of us are go-to tools when you're setting your book up, working out where to place it, the categories, the sort of information you can find out using Publisher Rocket in particular can be the difference between your book being profitable or not. And, and if it even shows up on the website to an extent, that's been kind of the biggest thing. Um, you know, it's really my whole journey started with me just asking the simple question of like, why does Amazon choose to show this book first and this book second? What is it that has happened that has created this kind of system? Why is it that I can't find this book? I'm searching for the title and yet it's not showing up. Whereas these other books are showing up, they don't even have that in the title. And so it just really sent my kind of analytical brain down this path. And um, it's always been just kind of a, a wonderful journey. Yeah. Now, I do want to talk about Atticus and one or two other things that you do, but we are mainly going to talk about categories uh, and that metadata, which has changed. So just to set the the stable, so not everyone's published a book yet who listens to the show. Some people have published a hundred of them, as most people, most of us are in between. So we know that up until recently, when you uploaded your book to KDP Amazon, you got to choose two categories. There was, if you knew people like you, you uh, were told by you that actually you could access 10 categories in total, but that was done via an email to customer support effectively and in conjunction with using again, your tools to work out which of those categories, what they're called and where they sit. And of course, they're different for print and different for UK, USA, and so on. However, that has all just changed. Do you want to set out what's happened? Yeah, absolutely. So the best way to start with this is to understand why Amazon used to do it the way they did. And this will help us to kind of unveil what's really going on. Because on the surface, the new system of categories seems pretty easy, but it's actually pretty bad. Um, there's a lot of, of what I call landmines that authors need to skirt around. And it kind of sucks that Amazon hasn't made this information available. So let's take a step back and look at what they used to do and why they did that. And this will help us understand why they tried to change it a bit. Uh, so when you, you know, before, when you would go into KDP, you could select two, but here's the thing. The two that you selected inside of KDP were not categories. They were actually BISACs, okay? Um, BISACs are like an international standardization categorization code. What that means is, is that um, back in the day, we used to have problems where publishing companies would just kind of come up with a category. They would look at the book and they would say, oh, okay, well, that's going to be uh, Winken, you know? And just like a random example here. And... Then they would send it off to the bookstores, right? They, you know, and the bookstores would open it up and some person would look down and be like, uh, Wiccan, huh? Hey, Bob, do we have a, 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 a section on Wiccan? Bob would scratch his head and be like, I don't know, maybe put in religion. Okay. You know, and then somebody else, you know, another store might say, oh, okay, put it in fantasy. The problem was, was that because all the categories were very different, um, it caused problems on the logistics where people wouldn't know where to put them. So they created this international standardization code where it's like, look, publishers, you can only select from these. And that helps all the other stores and the stores have in their database this ability to say, OK, well, if it is this particular bisect, then we in our store have to put it there. And it took out the subjective you know, opinion and it really made sure that it streamlined and made everything good. So Amazon abided by this BISAC system where you would select from those BISACs and then Amazon would figure out which Amazon category to put you in. But this caused a lot of real confusion because there's about 4,800 BISACs and there are over 14,000 Amazon categories. So it ended up being that authors that were just using the BISACs and sitting back were getting put into the same 4,800 super competitive categories. And the other categories weren't really being used or fulfilled. So later on, Amazon came up with a form 
uh, that authors could go to and they could write in and say, hey, Amazon, I selected these bias acts, but please put me in these categories. And Amazon human would actually go, OK, no problem. And within 24 hours, you would be added to more categories. So this is how it used to be. Now, granted, that's such a confusing way of handling it, right? A lot of authors didn't understand BISACs and they didn't understand the form. And quite frankly, the, the system had two major problems that occurred from this. The first is, is that Amazon was having to expend a lot of energy answering categories. Okay. Now, I'm sure many people have seen in the news that Amazon has been trying to cut costs and increase profitability. I have a very strong feeling that this might have been a part of that was we no longer need this team of all these people answering these forms. And this is taking up too many resources. So that was one part of it. The second part of it, too, was is that there was no subjective opinion. And so people could request whatever categories they wanted. And I think this this caused a lot of problems where books were being put in things that it shouldn't be in. Um, people were gaming the system that, you know, and so. Amazon probably realized that this was lowering in the customer value. So they decided to now shift to this new version, okay? Which is where when you go into KDP, you can select three categories. And what's beautiful is, is that it's no longer BISACs, it's actually Amazon categories. Makes it super simple. You can now see the 14,000 different categories to choose from. You can go select them. And when you're done, those are your three. But on the surface, most people think that's it, but there's a lot of really big problems about this, okay? The first thing to bring up with this is that when you have your three categories, uh, Amazon has the right, and they say this publicly, they have the right to remove you from any of the categories you've chosen and add you to any categories that they deem. Now, this is crazy because a lot of authors that are watching this constantly see their categories change. and a lot of times they're being put in categories they don't like or that they do not feel fit their book. And this has caused a lot of confusion. Okay. Um, so to answer that particular thing, we found out that what Amazon is doing is they're using the keywords that you've chosen to help their algorithm figure out what category you should be in. So if your keywords are talking about romance, this, you know, different types of romance, but you try to put your book into say, space opera or you know you, and there's no sci-fi term in there even though your book may be but you didn't describe it as such and there's no metadata that helps the algorithm figure this out amazon's just going to remove you out of the space opera even though that might actually be what you have um the other thing too and on the plus side so that's the negative on the plus side if amazon sees let's say that your you chose these three categories but man your book feels like it could be in this fourth category, okay? And the keywords are saying that it could be in the fourth category. And the shoppers who usually buy in that fourth category are also buying your book. Amazon's algorithm will then put you in an extra category. And the reason for this is that what they're trying to do, Amazon's always trying to make as much money as possible, right? That's, that's let's face it, the best way to understand Amazon is, does it make the money, right? If you can answer that, the answer is yes, then that's probably what they're doing and why. Well, for them, if they see a book that's really doing well, they want to do things. They want to show it off more. They want to put it in front of the shoppers that they believe will buy. And so this category system, again, allows them to automatically, without humans and therefore paying for resources, figure out where the book should go. And so the lesson learned for authors is that if you've done your research and you've chosen the categories that you really believe fit your book, then what you need to do is make sure that you are using certain keywords inside of your seven Kindle keyword boxes to solidify your spot in that category. And if you aren't doing that, you're going to leave it up to the out to this category algorithm to figure out where you go. And so my new recommendation to people, especially with category with keywords, is that you have your seven Kindle keyword boxes. And I recommend at least using two of those boxes specifically for category specific keywords so as to ensure Amazon doesn't mess with your categories. Okay, so so one takeaway from that is that the keywords are not a place to be clever thinking if you've got a romance storyline in your military thriller, and I think, well, I'll put some romance keywords in there. 
in the past, maybe that's going to help direct the odd person to your book and alert them to the fact that there's you know something in it for people who like that aspect. But now that could trip you up. It could. Yeah. Um, you know, fiction authors who are writing in authorian time, which, by the way, they're authorian is a category and that is a time period. Um, if they haven't used any words that are very specific at the time period, they have a weaker chance of staying in authorian. But if they have like keywords like authorian, you know, and and there's a whole list, I don't have the list in front of me. But if you're using those things, then Amazon's like, OK, clearly this book, like algorithmically speaking, this book should be in this category. And now you won't find yourself no longer in the category you selected. Does Amazon take account of the text of the book, the manuscript itself? So my understanding is on that, and this is, again, from past information, um, is that when so the search engine, they used to have its own website, okay? Because the search engine's algorithm is called A9, and it used to actually have a website called A9.com. Uh, funny thing is, a couple of years ago, um, the people behind A9 really ticked off Amazon, and Amazon shut them down and moved them under one of their VPs. Awesome news article about that. It was crazy. But in that battle between A9 and Amazon, a lot of really good nuggets dropped from it. Okay. Um, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, or maybe it was the uh, New York Times or so busted it open. But basically, A9 started complaining that Amazon was making them do things that they didn't think was right. And so they, some of their people let slip public information. Um, and then next thing you know, they got shut down. Hmm. But on the context of this, when that website existed, they used to say on their site that they would crawl the text of books to help better understand some things. So back then, there was um, they, they were at least publicly claiming to do so. I'm of the opinion now that they don't do it. And again, I'm going to stress to all the listeners that this is an opinion. I don't have facts on this. Okay, but there's two things that make me feel as though um, they don't do it uh, now. The first is, is that it would probably be through the look inside component. So they're probably going to scan if, if just the programmatic component of it, they're probably going to scroll the look inside aspect of it was well, as, as many of us authors know that the look inside thing is, is, is pretty trash. Um, they have a lot of problems uh, in their programming. There's a lot of issues on what actually shows up on the look inside. And so there's a lot of issues that can can lay in there. The second thing is, is that that just feels like a whole bunch of unnecessary uh, load of resources to have to interpret the beginning of the book and, you know, basically analyze that. And I think that it's a lot easier and less resource intensive by just looking at the title, the subtitle, the book description, the keywords, the categories, and that's more than enough for them to kind of paint the picture than having to OCR or, you know, go through and crawl the words and kind of figure out, you know, those kind of things, especially when their system is kind of junky. So, yeah. Although we do know that they read the book at the beginning when you upload it, because they'll pick up spelling errors. And obviously, thankfully never happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you, but I, I'm told it can reject books at that stage as well on quality basis. So there must be some level of machine learning AI that scans the text at the beginning, but maybe that's probably knowing Amazon a very different department from the departments later involved in the category placing. But uh, with AI and machine learning, this stuff becoming more powerful and quicker, it wouldn't surprise me in the future that they do start reading text and, and reviews. We have access to their their system on how they they check for the spelling. Uh, it's great. They've actually been working with us on Atticus uh, to kind uh. of one of the cool parts for Atticus is, is that they're working to give us the ability for books um, using Atticus to have Amazon, if they want to check it beforehand so that they'll tell you before you publish it. Here's all the spelling or the things we would flag. And then you can tell it. Nope. I intentionally misspelled it because my person, my character yeah. has a stutter or nope, disregard that because it's a part of the story. And then when you upload it, they won't flag it anymore. Uh, and so we're actually inside of that coding and that coding is not um, unless they're doing something crazy beyond it. But, you know, with an API key looking at their coding, they're specifically just looking for kind of spelling errors um, and certain flags that they have. But there's nothing that shows any again, machine learning from, from that respect. And if they're willing to hand it over to something that's not sending them the data, by the sure. way, which is great in my mind, I don't think that they're using it from a interpretation component of it. Now, then, now with 
Amazon getting closer and closer to using AI every day. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that might change. But uh, you're looking. You've you've always got to look on the inside, uh, Dave, which is brilliant. Um, now, so okay, so that's a really good takeaway in terms of the keywords. And I'm immediately going to go and look at my keywords after this conversation to make sure I haven't been too cute there and been uh, been reinforcing the genre. Um, I do love the whole reinforcing genre. It's like a mantra of mine anyway. When you do your blurb, do you cover every aspect of your Facebook ads and copy? Reinforcing genre is the number one task in all of those bits. So it makes sense that your keywords would do that as well. Now, there's something else that I've picked up that you've been talking about, which is that some of the categories we're being offered are what you've described as zombie categories. So not all is, is what it seems, even when we're selecting Amazon's own categories, right? Yeah. Uh, so this was the biggest shocker of the entire Amazon category system. And I actually call them ghost categories. Oh, ghosts, and, and the sorry. reason for it, <laughs> well, the reason for it is they're kind of like undead category. Uh, well, I guess you could call them zombies too, right? <laughs> um, so here's the, here's the worst part of this entire system. 27% of all of the categories that Amazon presents to authors are what I'm calling a ghost category. These categories are categories where no matter what you do, if you select it, you cannot rank in that category, which means you cannot get a bestseller tag. OK, you can't even state that you're a bestseller, even if you're selling better than any other book in that ghost category. The um, the other really bad part about these ghost categories is that there is no category page for that category. Like that means that if I'm a shopper and I'm looking for categories, you know, to choose from or buy or maybe there's a category I love. If I try to find it on the Amazon store, it doesn't exist. And so if you select out of your three categories, a ghost category, that is one of those categories where you cannot hit bestseller and shoppers can't find it. Now, it there's a lot of things to unpack from this, but but my biggest, biggest overarching statement is try to avoid them. Um, there's little to no cases where it actually benefits you. And so I think it's very important for authors to understand, whoa, if that's a, if that's a ghost category, the only reason why you should check select that is because you have no other option that ghost category really fits your book, then okay. All right. Um, so to best understand the weirdness of this, I'm going to start by explaining some terms to categories to help us so we can talk about it uh, better. So there's the first term that I'm going to use in this discussion, which is called category chain. OK, and a category chain is kind of like the, the path to the category. So it's like books, science fiction and fantasy, fantasy, dragon, you know, that entire term is what I call a category chain. OK, the next term that I'm going to use is called uh, either broad or main category, and that's the first one. So science fiction and fantasy is what we call the broad or the main category. All right. The other parts down that chain we call subcategories. But the final word, which in this case, I believe I use dragon. OK, the final part, that's what we call a placement category. OK, and so when we talk about the placement category, that is really important. That's the one where in your when you're in KDP and you select that little box and you select that category, that is your placement category. OK, so with all of that information, this is why it's really important to understand ghost categories. The ghost category is the placement category. So all of those other subcategories that I listed, and again, I'll say it again, books, uh, science fiction and fantasy, fantasy, and then dragon. The dragon is the placement. And I'm, I don't know if this one particularly is a ghost, but I'm just using it as an example. Um, the subcategory of science fiction, or I'm sorry, fantasy, that's still a category. You're still in that chain, okay? So if you select dragon, let's say dragon is a ghost, you cannot be a number one bestseller for dragon. OK, you, no matter what you do, no matter how many sales you make, because there is no ranking system for it. There is no page to show who ranks number one, two or three. It doesn't matter. However, though, you're still in the fantasy subcategory. And so that means that the only way you can rank number one from that is if you're number one in fantasy. So you can go up the chain to the next subcategory, OK, if it has placement. And so this is really important for authors to understand, because by selecting, say, dragon in this case, you are basically just selecting fantasy. That's kind of a huge waste. 
Um, the other really bad problem is that sometimes the subcategory above it has like five ghost categories under it. And if you select the three ghost categories inside of it, you just really all you did was just select fantasy and that's it. Yeah. So to kind of recap on that, these ghost categories, and again, it's a one in four chance that the category you select is a ghost. These ghost categories, you cannot rank number one for, you can't become a bestseller and shoppers can't find you. And it can waste one of your three, if not all three of your selections. Wow. How do we know if we selected a ghost category? So really there's, there's two ways. Okay. Um, the first way is that you need to, you need to basically investigate and see if there is a category page on Amazon. And if there isn't, then that's a very strong indication that it is a ghost category. Okay. Um, so one thing that I need to clarify with everybody here is that when you're in KDP and you go to select your categories, okay. Amazon, uh, Amazon shows you a link and you can click that link and that supposedly takes you to a category page. But here's the thing. That is not a category page. It is never a category page. It is so weird and so bad that Amazon doesn't send you to a category page. And some of you makes me feel as though this is their way of hiding the fact that there are ghost categories. What they do is they send you to a browser node. It's almost like a, an Amazon search, if you will. Um, you will notice that when you click those links in KDP to go check out the, what you think is a category page, you're going to see weird things that say like, you know, editor picks and some of our favorites and all, like all this information. You can't you won't find the ranking of the bestseller in the second, third, fourth and fifth. They just kind of send you to these browser nodes. So you can't use that uh, in order to say, oh, I clicked on a link and I see a page that must it must not be a ghost. Nope, nope, nope. Um, instead, what you need to do if you're doing this manually is you go to amazon.com and you start going down that category path on the left side. And if you can't find this category in that category path, then it doesn't exist. It's a ghost. Okay. That's about 90% of the way that you can do it. Okay. Um, when you do find a page and by the way, they still have the numbering system, but if you do find a page, you'll know that this is a ghost page. If you don't see the category system on the left side and they also don't have the name of the category at the top they just say bestseller so those are that's the way that you can manually do it and again it's a lot of clicking around and finding it um if you own publisher rocket it's actually really simple we tagged every one of the categories on whether it's ghost or not a ghost uh, we also give warnings and information about that that ghost. so if you hover over it and click you can see um and so so again it's like if you're using the category feature on Rocket, you find a couple of categories and you see that tag that says ghost, beware. And is this set in, not, probably not stone, but is it, how fluid is this system? I and mean, does Amazon dynamically think, actually lots of people have been clicking on this subcategory, let's give it a placement, let's make it a, a, a you know, take it out of ghost and make it a proper category? Uh, we haven't seen many changes from ghost to live and live to ghost. Um, I think a lot of this was just the system that they put in place. Um, and a lot of people have asked me too, like, well, why would they do this? And honestly, it's kind of a head scratcher. Um, some of me believes it's just Amazon being a little bit lazy. So there are a lot of times where, um, maybe authors have requested certain categories be created. Or there's a lot of changes in the whims of people, you know, terms that were, you know, nobody knew about 10 years ago are now kind of somewhat mainstream. And I think sometimes Amazon says, fine, we'll create this category. AK, okay, we'll just add it to a little, little list, you know, in KDP. But we don't have to restructure a website. We don't have to add to that link system. We don't have to create a brand new category page. And so they just kind of throw it in there. Um, my team and I are constantly crawling and monitoring this and checking and verifying. So if if we start to see them make changes, we're going to publish that and make sure people understand. But so far, we haven't seen them done do anything with that. And just to show kind of the problematic side of this system, did you know that there's seven categories right now that are called rename? <laughs> I like, really like no joke. That does like, sound like I was being lazy. Right. Like it literally there's there's one that I, and the placement category name is turtles. And then in parentheses next to turtles, it says in all caps, rename. Right. Like that's <laughs> how bad this. So 
all of that to say is I don't see Amazon spending a lot of time improving the system or realizing that, oh, we should do something about this when they still have seven categories that are called rename. Like the programmers put a note there and said, oh, we should rename this. And nobody cared. I mean, what? I don't know why they don't get you in, Dave, to talk to them for the afternoon and point all this stuff out to them. Oh, my gosh. I, I, I really believe that 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 would if they did that. There's a lot of things that I would highly yeah. recommend. And I think it would be incredibly beneficial for them as well as the author community. So it's not like a one-sided thing of like, yeah, I yeah. come in and say, okay, here's the five things you guys need to drop what you're doing and do for us. I'm saying, look, guys, you, you do this and it improves everybody's lives. And, but sometimes I just think that uh, Amazon is such a multi-headed Hydra that you can talk to one of the heads and it has no idea what the other heads are doing. Yeah. A fun fact, just to kind of highlight this, we've been doing a lot of programming work with um, with Amazon. And uh, this is, you'll laugh at this. When we were working with them, and specifically we're working with them about that thing I told you about, which is giving us the ability to be able to see the mistakes beforehand and send it to them. Well, I was talking to their head of Kindle development, right? And uh, that particular person had said, that when Amazon made the change where they were recommending EPUB files and no longer Mobi, they totally forgot to tell Kindle about this. Oh my goodness. Like their Kindle device. So all the programmers in the Kindle device had no idea that Amazon was gonna now send them EPUB instead of Mobi files. And they were scrambling. And for anybody who's ever tried to send an EPUB to a Kindle device, even today, we all know that that is stupid hard. Like it's weird. Well, that's why, because Amazon, one of the heads of the Hydra made a decision and the other head did it, had no idea. Wow. So I, 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 I say all that to kind of paint a picture of, you know, a lot of people are like, but why do they do this? Or why is it? And it's, that's, that's kind of a, yeah. an example of what it's like. And so it also I, means I don't think they're going to do much with it. We shouldn't overestimate this system. It's the, it, understanding it and using it to our, you know, exploiting it. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, but making sure our books are best placed to be successful is something we can do. This is not an all powerful thing that we have no control over. It's, it's not as clever as we think it is, is basically the answer there. Yeah, and and that's really it. It's not about gaming the system or hacking the system, but it's sadly Amazon didn't do a very good job with the system. And I think it's incredibly important for authors as well as publishing companies to really know about this. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like for a major publishing company's launch if they selected, you know, three ghost categories and they had no idea why they weren't a bestseller? Um, You know, well, same thing with authors. You've done all of this work to create this book and you do a major marketing push and you should be the number one bestseller, you know, in your category, you should have that mark. You should have, and no matter what you do, you can't do it. Um, And so really it's just being intentional. It's verifying the categories you're going to choose, make sure that they fit your book and are great. And then ensuring that you're not shooting yourself in the foot by selecting a ghost. The other thing too is, is that once you've done all that research and you've chosen these categories, just take a couple of lines on your seven Kindle keywords and solidify your placement. Make sure that you're not at the whims of the algorithm who can choose to put you in orphan, you know, or this thing that that you didn't, you know, select or want to be in. And by the way, seriously, if you haven't, you should try checking your categories. Um, I was going to ask you how we do, what's the best way of doing that? Yeah, well, Rocket Owners, easy. You can just put in the ASIN number of your book and it'll pop up and it will tell you like what the what Amazon is listing you for. Um, another one, there's a free tool out there called, uh, I think it's like Nerdy Book Girl Category Tool. If you just Google that, um, you can put in your ASIN in there as well and it will tell you exactly what Amazon is reporting your categories to be. That's a very important distinction for both the tools uh, because sometimes we've seen where the website Amazon says one thing, but in Amazon's database, it says something else. And that's exactly what both Rocket and Nerdy Booker are pulling from. So their records state that you're a part of these and that's how you can see it. So there is a possibility is that if you if you get your keywords a bit mixed up, that you will end up being put automatically into a ghost category. So one of the reasons for checking. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's one of the, that's one of the hard things for a lot of authors is, is that, um, because also too, Amazon took down that form 
basically for most people, you can't use the form. You can't communicate with them and tell them, guys, I selected these three and you got me in this weird thing. Like, that's not my book. Please take me out. Like, nope, you have no comms. So if you find yourself in that situation, okay, where you have selected these three and you go to look on Amazon, you find yourself in completely different ones. The best way is to go back in your to your KDP dashboard and update your categories and update the keywords to reflect it. And then that way they'll reanalyze. And we've seen that generally speaking, give it three to four days for them to take the right move. Um, but that's been a really good tactic for authors. They're, so they're the levers we have, categories. Those, uh, those ones. Okay. Um, I've got one other question for you, David. I don't know if we have an answer for this yet, but people who haven't played around with their categories since these changes came in may well still be in the 10 categories that they originally emailed and asked for. Should they stay put or should they reselect three? Is there an advantage to moving forward this this process? That is a phenomenal question, James. I um, And honestly, the answer is going to be it depends. Um, so there's a pro and a con to both of those arguments. For my books, I'm not touching them. <laughs> Okay. Um, That's because, well, because my, my, like, and I think the, the go, no go question for an author is, is how satisfied are you with say the traffic and the sales of your book? Okay. Uh, so if your sales and traffic, you know, your keywords, your category, they're all working, right? No need to rock that boat. Okay. Um, and you could jeopardize or hurt your traffic, hurt your rankings, hurt your, um, you know, the amount of times Amazon shows you by changing them up. Um, and so therefore, like I said, if your book is doing well and you relook it, I would refrain from touching it for as long as you can. However, though, if your book is not doing well, um, you know, the sales aren't happening or you feel like, you know, there's problems with it or, and generally speaking, diagnosis is you don't feel like Amazon's utilizing your book the way it should. Then I say, go in there and clean up your keywords and use the system because the pro to this is Amazon's system, I believe. And again, I'm, I'm going to stress that word. I believe, cause I don't have data to back this statement. Uh, I believe Amazon's new category system is more in line with their out with their algorithm, their metadata algorithm. And so they're using that information to better understand your book. So going in and aligning your book with the three categories and making sure that you've got keywords that stress those three categories. I feel like that's like using an updated version of a software than using the legacy version. Because right now my books are running on the legacy version and I'm, I'm OK with it because I don't need anything more. But for those of you that want to give it a little spin and maybe spruce it up or so, absolutely you know update that and you know get in line with their new system is that a fair fair way to yeah, answer that i think it is and uh, the only thing i can't remember is if you have to make some other changes to your book and you want to update the blurb are you forced into doing the category change at that point or can you leave it as is i can't remember that uh so from what i've seen and again i i don't know if they're going to change this but i've made a couple of changes to my books and they haven't forced me to but i have heard of other people saying so either a it's depends on what you're trying to change or b it is um you know a time period Being or a location out. so yeah. i can't answer that specifically yeah i know you do have to ask answer the ai question now even if you've made one oh yeah moved a full stop in your blurb but um the categories i was i had a feeling you're right uh at the moment it's not forcing you to to reselect okay all right well look that's that ca that section of the interview is brilliant i've got to take i've been making notes for things that i'm going to do to my books and the books we've got infused books to um uh to make sure that we are optimized in that sense and your knowledge is is really um Second to none on that day, so we appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, before oh, no I let problem. before I let you go, I do want to just ask you about Atticus, which is um, well, you better describe what Atticus is, and I'm and I'm quite excited about this collaborative rollout that's going to happen. Something we talked about hmm, probably two years ago to start off with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you know, it's funny as as an author, I've always um, I've used so many sets of software. You know, I, I use software for plotting. I use software for taking notes. I use software for then actually writing the book. Then I use software to work with my editor and then I use software for formatting. And so uh, as an author, I've always just I wish there was one, you know, like I didn't have to 
learn seven different softwares and pay for seven different softwares and and work within it. And so I've always wanted to have what I call is like, you know, the 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 one software to actually write your book. Um, and so a while ago, we started this company called Atticus, Atticus.io. And instead of trying to, to hit them all at once, we started with formatting. Um, you know, there's there's another great software out there called Vellum, but the problem with Vellum was it only works on Mac. And we also felt like there's a lot of features that could be added and some areas that could be improved on in just the formatting component. Um, but also, too, is that we added on the writing component. So authors can write inside of, of Atticus, and we've been adding more and more to make it so. Um, and then they can format in it, which is nice. But the biggest thing that we've been working on uh, is what's collaboration. Um, now, imagine that you could write your book and you can collaborate with another writer. You can then bring in an editor uh, and work within that same software. And then, you know, you can bring your ARC readers and you can look at their comments and you can look at, um, you know, you can have your co-writer look at their comments and you guys can discuss it together. And and so we've been designing this and I can't say the exact date when the collaboration is coming out, um, but we're really on the cusp of something great. Um, I'm really excited about this because I think that will really change the way not just that writers work, but also publishing companies. Um, if you're a small to medium publisher, imagine that you can open up a dashboard and see all of your projects, where they're at, how authors are doing. You can tag in your editor to start editing this book that is now ready and bring in your art readers. And then, you know, you can start planning your marketing because of what you see. And so I'm, I'm just really excited about that. But I think by the time, um, and maybe my, my co-founder will be bummed about this, but I'm going to announce it anyways. By the time this comes out, uh, we should be either really close or should have uh, a whole bunch of really awesome new features in, in Atticus to include all of the Google fonts. So instead right. of choosing like six or seven fonts and formatting, you can actually access just about any font you want in that respect. Um, and we've got a couple of other things coming out soon, too. Wow. So, okay. It's just been a wonderful project. Yeah. Yeah, sounds good. And we'll keep an eye on that evolution. So Atticus.io is the place to go if people want to learn a bit more about that. Uh, how much does it cost, Dave, Atticus? So it's a one-time cost of $147. And that's it. So you get your updates and all those capabilities. And when collaboration comes out, you'll have that right away too, which is nice. So Super. I'm not much of a subscription-based fan, I know. especially I'm, on something. Yeah. Like if I'm writing my book, like I don't like the idea of having to pay just to keep using the thing that's holding my books. I don't know. It's just yeah, never been my jam. It is. Um, well, it's the same with us, as you know. You buy a course and um, there's some people who've done extremely well buying the course in 2015 and have had so much more added to it. Um, oh, my goodness, right? Then, but yeah, uh, yeah. It's, uh, it seems like a fair and equitable way. Rewards those early adopters as well. Absolutely. Okay, Dave. Brilliant talking to you. Love actionable interviews. Uh, and it's always good to talk to an expert. So look, I really appreciate the time and effort you put into the community. I'm sorry we're not going to see you uh, out and about in Vegas. We were talking off air before we started. You've got a lot of a lot of things going on in the non-author world as well. And I know that's going to start occupying you over the next year or so. But uh, you won't be far away from us, I'm sure. No, no, definitely. Especially if I get out to England or so, I have to stop by and say hi. Yeah. Um, but as always, really appreciate you. And uh, I look forward to maybe sharing a beer sometime. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Dave. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Dave Chestnut, I do love that southern accent he has. And he's like Peter Pan, Dave. He looks younger. I, I, he does, yeah. He's a, there's a, I think I've said it before. There's a portrait in his attic or, somewhere, or a filter, um, or, a, or indeed a filter. Yes, he, he it's entirely possible. He likes his tech, so maybe he's got, he's got some kind of weird filter on his webcam. Who knows? What's, do you say webcam anymore? Probably don't say webcam. Do you? Uh, yeah, camera, built-in camera. His camera. Um, God, I sound yes. Old. Uh, it's probably a filter. Let's talk of a filter. I had an interesting time on TikTok. This one. I don't know if you you geek out about airplanes, not quite as much as I do, but um, about thirty. Air I mean, I noticed this yesterday because I have Flight Radar Twenty Four. My watch gives a ping if if any aircraft anywhere in the world squawks the emergency code seven seven zero zero. So if oh I like God. lose an engine, and have a medical emergency on board, and the seven seven zero zero get priority. And it just lights them up on on the air traffic boards. Well, yesterday loads went off, and I thought, oh, is something happening? There was stuff happening, of course, in the Middle East, and I think, is something happening this morning? About seventy aircraft 
in Russia all squawked emergency at the same time. Never seen anything like it before. And I looked at the map and did a TikTok post on it. But um, we are now thinking that somebody is doing some sort of hacking of the ADSB system. Oh, Maybe not goodness. the aircraft themselves, but is mimicking their squawks, uh, which will be causing chaos uh, in air traffic control. But all of that's happening at the moment. And um, Welcome to the self-publishing yeah. show. Self-publishing well, show. The, welcome, welcome to uh, Flight Radar TikTok 24. visibility is a very important um, part of my marketing. So uh, any excuse you get to stick <laughs> something up there. So that's what uh, she said. Anyway, um, good. Oh my god, <laughs> it gets worse. Sorry, everybody. This is, he's, he's even uh, worse than all. Are you nurse. I'm admiring my teeth now. I've got uh, finally after oh, two yes. years lost yeah, my braces. Oh my goodness, very good. Blinding. Blinding. I haven't done the whitening yet. They're they're pretty white, but they need uh, apparently. I'm, sure I'm going to be like coming. Ross. <laughs> no, the whitening's next week. I'll be like Ross. Uh, it's only <laughs> since I started doing this podcast that I can became worried about not worried but it just noticed that my teeth were crooked and i think it's not a bad thing to get sorted out i think the word you're looking for is vain 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 i'm not oh, it's a new word you're so vain you probably think this podcast is about you well apparently it's not because it's you did not. it by yourself last week and you got loads it's of positive feedback <laughs> you meanies audience why I did know. you say that when you say about me anyway <laughs> um Here good no one's listening at no, this no. point, so you won't, there'll no, be no comments. It's, it's you and me. Us, Good. Okay, look, I want to say thank you to Dave Chesson. Uh, our interviews, uh, excellent fountain of knowledge, and uh, he's taking a bit of a backseat. He's not going to travel as much next year, but we hope to see him around at some point. Must get back to Nashville at some point. It's such a fabulous city. Fun night out. Um, that's it. Thank you to Catherine and Tom and Stuart. Uh, is that everyone uh, in the background? Uh, Mel, uh, who help uh, put this podcast together. Lots of hands make light work. And don't forget, Launchpad is open, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash launchpad on November the 1st. And you can buy tickets to the self-publishing show live to this show, but live on stage in London, June the 25th, 26th. If you don't know anyone in the self-publishing world, come along because we're going to make sure that there's a way that you will meet people or if you just want to stand by yourself you can also do that but you can definitely come and say hello to me and mark and we'd be delighted if you did that so it'd be a good chance for you to dip your toes into live events that is uh, june in 2024 tickets on sale now it will probably sell out before the event but uh, so buy sooner rather than later and that's selfpublishingformula.com forward slash sps live that's it thank you very much indeed all it remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him and a goodbye from me goodbye, goodbye. get show notes the podcast archive and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com join our thriving facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash facebook support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author publishing is changing so get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show